so the learning object, uh, objectives are to be able to select the appropriate enrichment test for your data, uh, to be able to determine the background list when running a, a fissure zigzag test, for example, or a hypergeometric test, uh, then to be able to understand what a ranked list, uh, how a ranked list is interpreted with a minimum hypergeometric test, and to be able to determine when you need to apply a multiple testing correction and in the genomics you mostly will need to do that. And then there's a couple of different multiple testing corrections and uh, you should be able to understand what the Bontaroni correction does or what a false rediscovery rate does. And you should be able to uh, understand or explain how you do either of those tests. Okay, so the outline. Uh, first we introduce enrichment analysis but we touched on that in the previous lecture. Uh, then we can talk about the hypergeometric test um, and then a ranked version of that test and then these couple of multiple testing corrections. Um, so as we discussed, there's a, the, one of the most important parts of a pathway enrichment analysis is a gene list and then um, usually or in the sim very simple case you just uh, pick a gene list that has no additional information. It's a list of genes, uh, you were depending uh, on a various parameters to define that gene list for example, you may have picked genes that have uh, a significance of less than 5% uh, from random analysis. And then you would ask, uh, are any gene sets or corresponding pathways and processes surprisingly frequently present in my gene list of interest? So, in other words, does my experiment pull out um, some sort of common biology uh, from, uh, from known pathway databases? Um, then the community commonly uses the Fisher's exact test or the hypergeometric test in order to determine how surprising that really is. A ranked uh, list, uh, in the case of a ranked list, uh, which is sometimes recommended because ranked lists have more information for pathway enrichment analysis, uh, you would expand uh, your uh, Fisher's exact test to a, a gene ranking rather than a flat free list. And in this case, you would answer the question, are any gene sets ranked surprisingly high in my ranked list of genes? So, in other words, are the pathway genes appearing very high in the list? And as we know, the genes in the list will be ranked according to some decreasing uh, significance. Then, are the pathway genes generally with higher scores in my input list? Um, the statistical test here is a minimum hypergeometric test. Uh, I won't be discussing GSCA, but Veronique will discuss GSCA. So, GSCA is another approach of doing genome-wide ranked list analysis. Uh, so this is um, um, a common scenario or a, an overview of your flow wor workflow. Uh, you, you can have a, a microarray or an RNA-seq experiment or any other omics experiment, uh, which essentially is a, is a gene expression table where genes are going from top to bottom and they have their particular values. Then there is a black box called enrichment test, and that will spit out um, a list of genes, um, sorry, a list of pathways that have a significant p-value associated to a gene list. And then the black box also takes gene set or pathway databases as its input. Um, so we discussed that scenario quite a bit in the previous lecture. We have a gene list, we have some uh, gene sets or annotations from gene ontology, uh, and we ask are any of these gene annotations surprisingly enriched in the experimental gene list? Um, and then the details are the following. Uh, where do they come from? Both the gene lists as, uh, as well as the uh, gene sets. How do we assess surprisingly? And that is the main topic of this lecture. And how to correctly repeat these tests and not to become overly enthusiastic about the data that you see. Um, so the most common design that people use in omics experiments uh, is a two-class design. You would have uh, cases in blue and controls in red or vice versa. You, know, you compare a particular uh, set of samples to some control samples. Uh, and you know that the, there will be some gene expression differences, which you have determined with uh, solid statistical techniques, hopefully, and you have hopefully also created a good experimental design so there are no strong cofactors or confounding factors in your experimental matrix. Uh, and then uh, having uh, run through a, a gene expression analysis, for example, or a proteomics analysis, uh, you can rank your genes according to how different they are between cases and controls. So, Ranking these genes will give you both genes that are upregulated in cases and downregulated in, in cases relative to controls. And there's uh, several ways of going about it. The first simple way is to, uh, is to just select your genes of interest according to some threshold. Uh, a reliable threshold would be selecting these genes by statistics. So 
any genes that upregulate uh, uh, with a p-value less than 0 0.05. An unreliable way of doing it is uh, selecting genes according to fold change. Please don't do that. That is a bad idea. So always use some sort of statistics uh, because fold change would not reflect the error in, in data, right? Fold change could be incredibly high, but it's meaningless if the error is also incredibly high. So you should always use statistics to do this, uh, uh, to do thresholding if you do do thresholding. An alternative version is not to do any thresholding and let the pathway analysis take care of it, but that's a different approach. So uh, this will give you uh, a gene list that you significantly trust in some sense. And if it's a gene expression analysis, you could actually have two gene lists. You could have the genes that are going up according to some threshold, and you could have another gene list that is going down according to some threshold, or you could have a mixed gene list. It's actually up to you what you want to do, uh, but maybe you want to start with the simplest approach and just start one, with one gene list. Uh, in, a, in some other cases, you may have time courses. For example, you take uh, omics measurements from genes at certain time intervals. Maybe you're testing how well the drug works. Uh, and then you can also uh, transform that uh, time-wise gene expression matrix or any other experimental uh, matrix of measures uh, into gene sets. So you can uh, perform, for example, clustering or ranking, and each one of those clusters becomes your gene list of interest. Mm. And then each one of those clusters you can uh, analyze for, for functions and pathways, saying that uh, maybe apoptotic uh, pathways become um, upregulated over time because the drug starts to work. So how do we perform a gene list enrichment test? First, we have uh, a gene expression table, as we discussed. Then we have a certain lists of genes that we trust, maybe are upregulated with a significant, uh, significant p-value. We have all these pathway databases. We select one of those pathway data sets in these pathway databases, representing particular biological knowledge. Um, and then we count how many genes from that gene set land in our upregulated gene list, how many land uh, elsewhere outside our threshold. And then the p-value to measure that surprisingness of the overlap between the gene set and the gene list is basically um, related to how, how much you would expect your genes to be in that pathway if these genes were drawn randomly. So the underlying assumption is that you uh, sample many genes of that size uh, from, uh, uh, from your original experimental matrix each time count how many genes you get into that pathway and that gives you a background estimate. O obviously we don't need to do that all the time because there are standard statistical tests that works with these distributions but this is the meaning of, of the p-value there. How often would you see such a result if the data were randomly generated? So this is a recipe for high-impact publications. Define your gene list and background list. Uh, select the gene sets that you want to test for enrichment. Run necessary enrichment tests um, and correct for multiple testing always. Uh, then interpret your enrichments, find out the new mechanism and publish. Uh, so why would you even bother uh, thinking about the more complicated case when you have a ranked list of genes? Well, the possible problems with just testing a flat list is that you don't really know where to draw the threshold. So you could say, I trust genes with 5% error rate. So this was p-value 0.05 for a cutoff. Uh, but then, you know, it, it's due diligence that you try different cutoffs. Do they actually reflect the same biology or do, do all your results disappear when you select the more stringent cutoff? Um, and then you can also see that you can get the loss of statistical power because you, you constrain yourself to a way too stringent threshold. So to avoid that situation, you may want to consider a ranked gene list instead, because each gene in the ranked gene list will have a particular significance p-value from gene-by-gene gene expression analysis. And as you allow more um, movement, or if you allow more power to your pathway analysis, then it may be able to detect sign like signals among genes that are near the threshold, but a little bit lower. So this is one of the reasons why you want to uh, work with a ranked gene list. Uh, so in a ranked gene list, uh, instead of uh, splitting your matrix into uh, genes that we're interested in and other genes that we're not interested in, each gene will have a value uh, that will decrease, uh, and then the most interesting genes would uh, lie on the top. And again, you look at this uh, 
black box, which in this case is called the minimum hypergeometric test, and it will again spit out a list of pathways uh, that are significantly associated to your experimentally derived GNIST. And again, you, you will have to do it across many different pathway uh, sets in order to capture the entire pathway space. Yep. One question on the actual ranking, because there is a, I guess, a brief discussion on how you actually, what kind of metric mm -hmm. you use in order to rank uh, the, the genes yes. in the rank case. And uh, so what do you normally use? Because many people use like the p-value plus, you know, if it's up if the gene is upregulated mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. downregulated. Other people think that it's a good idea to also, to also include the whole change uh, in, in the metric plus the p-value somehow. Uh, so what do you normally use as a ranking? Because the values have to be unique, right? As far as, far as I know, mm -hmm. in the case of GCA, they yeah. have to be unique, otherwise it's not So point number one, don't use FTR for ranking, mm -hmm. because FTR will do exactly what you say. FTR will uh, flatten. Mm -hmm. So instead of a continuous uh, row of var variable values, you would see something more like a staircase. Right. So, it, so uh, in ranking, FDR won't work as nicely because it doesn't give a complete ranking. Mm -hmm. Generally, I would recommend starting with the simplest type of ranking. Just use one variable. Because the more combinations you choose, the more questions you will introduce. Mm -hmm. P-value is oftentimes a good way of ranking. If, you're, if you have reason to believe that in your experiment there was more upregulation of genes than downregulation of genes, or if you want to capture something that's clearly being upregulated a priori, then you may want to, you know, maybe separate your list into two lists, one being upregulated and another being downregulated. Try to sort them by a combination of uh, fold change and p-value. But each time you make a combination, you have to justify why did I pick this type of a combination and not the other. So simpler is better. And then the other, um, the other suggestion is that if there's something solid going on in your data, some, some true signal, then it should come out whatever you do with the data in various ways. You should see the same thing over and over and over again, regardless of your parameters. Okay. So in terms of recipes, when you do have a ranked list of uh, genes, then the recipe is not that different. You rank your genes in a meaningful way, uh, make sure you validate that the ranking is, uh, is robust to changes in parameters. You can select up and down regulated genes separately. Uh, you can use a linear threshold. Now, depending on the method, a GSCA would require you to have all the genes to have some meaningful signal. G profiler would re uh, require you to have some uh, list. It could be a long list, but still has to be a subset of all genes. So use a linear threshold. In that case, you won't uh, put yourself into doubt whether there is anything more interesting below the threshold. Um, then select the gene sets or pathways to test for enrichment, which we discussed in the previous lecture. You run your enrichment tests. You definitely need to correct for multiple testing when you have a ranked list. Uh, this is because in a ranked list, uh, you will test more hypotheses. So uh, false discovery rate is even more important. You have to interpret the results carefully, and then you publish. You can do that. Good, good. Uh, so the question was whether upregulated and downregulated genes are in the same list or whether they are part of different lists. Now, this will depend on which method you use. GSCA will have everything in the same list. G profiler in this case would require you to have uh, one list for upregulated genes and another for down. Or you could combine them all together, but then a different ranking needs to be used. You could rank them by p-value, and then you, you would expect that up and down regulated genes are somewhat mixed when they come after another in the ranking. So the theory um, in, the, in the lecture is the following. How does a hypergeometric test work uh, in broad principles? And how does the ranked version, so the minimum hypergeometric test work? And then we discuss two different multiple testing corrections, uh, the classical Barferoni test and then the more common benjamini hopper test that is frequently used in genomics. So the hypergeometric test, or the Fisher's exact test, um, 
I think they're the same things and one of them is doing an exact computation another one is doing a, an approximate we have good computing power so we usually do the exact test these days but the null hypothesis is that our gene list is a random sample from the population and the classical textbook example of that population is a is a bowl full of balls and then the balls are either uh, red or black in this case and then the black genes would be maybe the ones that are involved in a particular pathway and then the red is, uh, is a population of genes that are not involved in the pathway. So we, we pull out a random set of genes and then we would expect that you know, most of them are red, some of them are black, or maybe none of them are black. And then we see this particular list where actually most of them are turned to be black, so we're associated <laughs> to the particular pathway. And we want to understand, is that uh, a, a random uh, draw or is it more likely to reflect some underlying biology? And then this is done with the hypergeometric distribution where we know the probability of how many balls we are likely to pull out. Uh, if we pull, pull out five, then how many of them are likely to be black or, or red uh, randomly. So in most cases, you would observe uh, zero uh, black balls, sometimes one, and then there's a, a long tail uh, of uh, more rare events. And then the p-value is the sum of your observation. So uh, four black uh, out of five versus uh, anything more extreme to that. So a p-value is always a sum of probabilities. In this case, it would be the sum of probabilities that you see uh, four black balls plus the probability that you see five, something even more extreme. Okay. And then uh, when you do this analysis in a software like R, then most likely you will be uh, compiling a contingency table, which is a two by two table, uh, measuring whether your gene is in a pathway or not, and whether uh, all the genes are in the pathway or not. And then th this is a standard input that you would provide to uh, this Fisher's exact test, and that would give you uh, a p-value in response. A couple of important details. Most of the time, we are measuring overrepresentation in a pathway enrichment analysis. So we want to know, are there more apoptotic genes uh, present in my, uh, in my list of experimental genes? Sometimes you may want to measure for underrepresentation. Are some genes or, or others depleted or fewer than uh, expected in my list of genes? And then you would just reverse that hypothesis uh, and uh, instead of measuring uh, um, over-representation of red, you measure under-representation of black, or vice versa. Um, now, I, I just have to mention that this kind of comes with certain caveats. Uh, the true negative of biology is way less described. So a gene that is not related to apoptosis according to a pathway database doesn't mean that it's not related to apoptosis. We, have, we just haven't discovered it yet. So there are no good databases out there of negative results. So measuring under-representation sort of comes with that caveat. Now, another thing that I also mentioned during the previous lecture is that you need to choose your background population appropriately. And that has to do with sampling of genes, genes from the background. And one example is that if you limit uh, your search space considerably, uh, then you need to account that in your pathway analysis. Uh, for instance, uh, in RNA-seq analysis, uh, oftentimes people uh, will discard transcripts that are lower than a certain level in their expression. Uh, it seems like a harmless move, you just want to remove noise. Uh, but if that covers a substantial number of your transcripts, say you used to measure uh, 18,000 genes and now you're only measuring 12,000, that that means that you cannot, um, your sampling error cannot be the entire genome anymore, but it has to be the highly expressed transcriptome. Because otherwise, you will overemphasize the pathways that tend to be highly expressed. Um, and then and therefore, you need to, this bin needs to only include the genes uh, that weren't filtered uh, because of their low transcription. And uh, you, can, uh, you can probably recognize the difference when you do practical analysis and you either don't provide the background set uh, and you analyze the every gene in the genome, or you provide the list of genes uh, that weren't filtered. And you, you would expect to see way fewer pathways pop up once you provide the right search space because you're not no longer biasing it yourself towards uh, the highly expressed trend. Um, and this, this becomes especially acute if you, uh, for example, you're only interested in transcription factors. 
say you do a, uh, you're looking at chip seek data or transcription factor binding data, your search space is suddenly 1800 transcription factors instead of 18,000 genes. And then any pathway analysis uh, you do uh, that only includes transcription factors, you will get transcriptional processes out unless you restrict yourself to this, uh, to this search space that you predefine in your experimental setup. Okay, so other enrichment tests, uh, we're talking about Fisher's exact test and then uh, there are other tests that do the same thing with certain uh, differences in their statistical assumptions. We have a binomial test or a chi-square test. When we considered ranked list analysis, then there are many different varieties of GSEA and related approaches. And the, on, in the statistical test, there's Wilkinson rank, rank sum, Kolmogorov, Smirnov, and so on. And many times, if you have your your own uh, previously not well described data, you may want to design your own pathway analysis test. Uh, what I would recommend is uh, uh, using permutation tests to randomly sample genes from your uh, lists and see how frequently you will see pathways show up as a sanity check. Before really with getting enthusiastic about your results, try, try to repeat your experiment by randomly sampling genes and seeing if, if you see anything equivalent show up. So the minimum hypergeometric test is essentially a series of hypergeometric tests or Fisher's exact tests that are performed on increasing lists of genes uh, from your input. So the assumption here is that if you have ranked your genes in a meaningful way, then the most important genes are lying in the beginning of your list. And as you increase uh, the cutoff, then you get fewer and fewer very important genes and then uh, their scores also diminish. So uh, the way the minimum hypergeometric test works is that you calculate p-values at multiple thresholds, multiple thresholds of input list, and then um, you determine some sort of an optimum where the overlap with the pathway is the best. Uh, and then you correct for multiple testing. So maybe that is a good visualization here. This is your gene list. The color intensity uh, represents the scores. And then uh, you, we want to find out where are genes of a particular pathway. So this MG, MHG method always works on one pathway at a time. So all the stripes over here uh, are the various uh, members of that pathway. And you can quickly see that most of them seem to be uh, located in the red area, so they clustered towards the beginning of the list, so they have higher scores. And then the question that the method works on is that whether the distribution is random or there seems to be an enrichment of the, of the pathway genes towards the beginning of the list. So what happens here is that at each, uh, uh, at each point in your list, a hypergeometric test is performed and it's calculated how surprising it is to see so many pathway genes at this low end of the, at this high end of the gene list. So a hypergeometric test occurs at each one of those steps uh, along the curve. And then we determine that uh, in this position of the gene ranking, the score is the highest. So there the surprisingness of seeing so many pathway genes is the highest. And that, that also tells you that maybe for this particular pathway, most of the interesting uh, genes uh, lie within that little block and then the significant enrichment starts to drop down because fewer and fewer pathway genes are, are present in that list after the, after the cutoff. Why would we bother with such a uh, more complicated approach of uh, analyzing gene lists? Um, first of all, we don't know where the pathway genes are located in the list and uh, different, pathway, different pathways may have different uh, genes. Um, so this approach is much more sensitive compared to a flat, flat list of genes because you can imagine that some very specific pathways uh, have so small numbers that they wouldn't come out as significant if you consider the entire list that you selected. So your, your selected list may be a few thousand genes and then the pathway only has 10, but all of those 10 pathway genes are just the top 10 of your list that you analyzed. <laughs> so those top 10 genes would be highly significant if you only considered the first portion of your list, but they wouldn't be significant if you consider the entire list. On the other hand, there may be some general pathways that you're interested in with hundreds of members, or maybe let's call them biological processes, so we wouldn't think too detailed about the pathway. Uh, however, they would be more scattered around your long list, but yet still remain significant because there's many more of them. 
if you only considered a very small, small proportion in the beginning of your list, you would lose that more general pathway signal because you wouldn't be looking at the big picture. So in that sense, uh, using the ranked list is uh, often preferable to using a flat list of genes as input, but you need to be sure of your ranking. So as we mentioned before, garbage in, garbage out. If your ranking uh, is of low quality, you may see results in pathway analysis that are not really representative of biology. Uh, what you also need to know is that uh, this minimum hypergeometric test uh, is more sensitive, but it also does more statistical testing within. So multiple testing correction becomes even more significant because you're more likely to encounter highly significant p-values in any data, even random data. And then uh, you have to be more conservative and careful about that. So multiple testing corrections are just your tools against that issue of seeing way too much signal that turns out to be false positive. And why would we actually see multiple testing uh, uh, issues? Is uh, how, do you, how do you imagine yourself winning a lottery if lottery tickets were, were for free? You would just take a whole box of those lottery tickets and one of them would end up being the winner, right? And then, but unfortunately you have to pay for these lottery tickets so you'll never get a whole box. But uh, when you do bio bioinformatics analysis, lottery tickets don't uh, cost anything, so therefore you can try again and again and again. And in pathway analysis, you naturally try again and again because you try all these different pathways. And when, uh, when you have this background population of urn or bowl of bowls, they sample only once, then you expect to see this uh, sort of distribution where most of the bowls are red and one of them is black. But if you sample long enough and you keep on sampling, then ultimately you will get the jackpot or you will get a, something that looks really significant just by chance because you were doing it a number of times. And multiple testing corrections are essentially methods to systematically uh, fight that effect of uh, seeing things highly significant because you just kept on trying. And then when you have a, a particular p-value, say 0 0.01, then you would expect a, an equivalent enrichment uh, if you try at least so many times. So if you have 0 0.01, then if you try a hundred times, then you likely see one of those results that looks good, even if you do it in totally random data. So that, this is the reason why you always have to think, do I need FDR? Do I need multiple testing correction? And most of the times the question is yes. Okay, uh, another way of um, winning the p-value lottery is even if you don't have the same bowl of balls, but you have different bowl of balls, you try uh, different various hypotheses and you try to find the right answer, then ultimately you will find an answer that looks good if you don't uh, correct for multiple testing. So in this case, uh, you are sampling from black and red balls, but you're also sampling from square and uh, round figures. So if you test all these different potential, uh, potential outcomes, you will find an outcome that, uh, that looks legitimate but you need to test for multiple uh, corrections. So the, the earliest and the simplest multiple testing correction is called the Bonferroni correction. And the Bonferroni works on the following assumption. If m is the number of uh, uh, tests you run, for example, m is the number of pathways that you analyze for enrichment, uh, then you should be very conservative about each p-value, and you should essentially take every p-value that you observe and multiply it by m. And that will, uh, that will deal very efficiently and quickly with all of the significant p-values because that's a very stringent correction. And the assumption here is that uh, the corrected p-value is greater or equal uh, to the probability that at least one of the observed enrichment is random. So at least one. You run 100 tests, so at least one of them will be wrong. And that's a pretty strong assumption because the, the opposite of this assumption is that none of them are wrong. Right? So you, you take your set of p-values, you multiply them by m, and you, the resulting p-values are the ones that you should be interpreting. Um, and then the jargon or statistical way of saying is that we control the, for the family-wise error rate, FWER. And then this is uh, to date even used, I think, in genome-wide association studies. People talk about Bonferroni sometimes. So the problem with Bonferroni is that it's very stringent and it kind of wash away uh, real results. So especially if your signal is not that strong, then applying Bonferroni on it will probably result in everything being uh, p-value of 1 or above 0 
Uh, and then these days, the more common uh, way of accepting this false discovery is um, you put a less stringent condition. So the false discovery rate or FTR leads to gentler correction, and there's a there's a fundamental difference between the assumptions here. Uh, so FTR is the expected proportion of observed enrichments to be wrong or to be caused by random chance. So in this case, this would be 5%, right? If you have 100 draws, then after the correction, you accept that five of them could be wrong. Compared to the Bonferroni, where we allowed only zero or more to be, it's either zero or wrong, or one or more are wrong. So FTR um, allows us to introduce more error into our measurements after multiple testing correction. However, it also uh, provides us with better chance of finding something in our data. Uh, the usual procedure for FTR is calculating using the benjamini hopper procedure, but there are several other procedures which are claimed to be uh, more or less stringent. It's also important to know that benjamini hopper procedure is not ideally suited for the pathway case uh, because it assumes independence. Uh, pathways are, are not independent by any means. Uh, I, I showed you the hierarchy before and also we know that genes are involved in many processes. So. But regardless, we're always using these different techniques, even though we know that they're not independent. So the FTR threshold is often called a Q-value, which relates to the P-value, but it has been uh, uh, corrected to be more conservative. Okay, and I'll walk you through this one example. Please bear with me, because this is a little uh, difficult to explain, but uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see how it works on an example. So, for, for instance, we have... Um, tested all these pathways against our particular list of genes and retrieved a, a p-value for each. Uh, what we need to do next is we need to, in order to apply the FTR procedure, uh, we need to rank them from the, from the strongest p-value all the way to the weakest p-value and also count how many there are. So in this case we were analyzing only 53 pathways, maybe from a very stringent pathway database. Uh, then the adjusted p-value is the following. We take the nominal p-value, we multiply uh, by how many p-values there were all together. So this is almost like the Bonferroni procedure, except that we also divide it by the rank of that p-value. right? Uh, so the first will be divided by 1, the second by 2, the, then by 3, and so on. And then we get some sort of an adjusted p-value, uh, which will be further transformed. Some of them actually go beyond 1. And then the Q value is uh, the correspond it corresponds to the nominal p-value such that the, the smallest adjusted p-value is assigned to the same or highest ranks. So uh, you see that one of those p-values here obtains 0.04 and then anything above that higher in the rank will be assigned 0.04 and anything below will be assigned the second rank. So this is how uh, you see that the, the FDR procedure uh, takes uh, the continuous space of p-values and it makes it more uh, a discrete space where it looks like a staircase, right? There's a block of uh, results that go at 0 0.04 and then another block that go at 0 0.05. So among other things you need to notice that this doesn't, doesn't no longer provide uh, a good ranking because we don't really know what their rank is. They've been flattened out a little bit. And also note how the nominal p-value uh, used to be very, very significant, or like reasonably insignificant, and now it's corrected to something that uh, is more close to the, your traditional threshold. So this is how the multiple testing uh, correction works, the more, more common one, the benjamini Hopper one. It just uh, converts each, each finding to something that is a more conservative finding. And no matter what you do, the more results you test at a time, the more stringent this conversion becomes. So one way to deal with strong multiple testing issues is to a priori select a narrower set of hypotheses to test. Uh, oh, and then the last thing is that the p-value threshold for FTR 0.05 is actually 0.031 that corresponds to that level where the last result was still considered significant. So uh, that result is no longer considered significant because it's going above the classical 0.05. And anything below will, will increasingly get a p-value that's closer to 1. So the, the, fact, the fact that all those p-values are equivalent to each other, is that, is that like a mathematical consequence of doing this, or is it just the, is it just the data? Uh, this, is, uh, this is what you commonly see. 
that uh, it will uh, it will flatten out the group of, uh, of p values into the same range, and then uh, same range, it, but not the actual same number, right? It depends. Uh, you you may see like uh, the the first value, the very first, the very high p value would uh, remain unique next compared to the next one, and then there will be a region or an area or a sequence of them where uh, where the corrected p values are all the same, and then they drop down a little bit more, so it really looks like a staircase. Yes? Is there some sort of movement factor in the video that you're seeing that would determine how many patterns you want to test? Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't think that's a good way of estimating just by uh, looking at your gene list length or anything like that. I would recommend starting simple restricting yourself to fewer pathways and then expanding from there rather than vice versa. Selecting fewer pathways for a start also has the advantage of you making fewer tests and subjecting to your, yourself to fewer multiple testing correction effects. So as, as I just mentioned, uh, the correction strength of a multiple testing correction directly depends on how many tests you do. So if you have a large data set, you wish to analyze many, many pathways with it, then the best way is to choose a test that is really sensitive. Or vice versa, if you know that your data is pretty noisy um, and uh, you don't have a, an opportunity to do a very sensitive test on it, then choose fewer uh, pathways to, to work on. So maybe you know, that also answers the previous question. If, if there's a lot of noise, then do so that you don't do too many tests in the beginning. As that, and as from the previous lecture, it probably makes sense for you to test the most interpretable pathways first. So biological processes, maybe react to molecular pathways, rather than diving in into very noisy and complex uh, uh, pathways that you are likely not going to interpret. Another uh, uh, aspect that you can also do is I, I showed you the diagram um, or the hierarchy of the gene ontology. That also means that uh, uh, the gene ontology gene sets or the corresponding gene sets to gene, on, uh, gene ontology terms are wi widely variable in their sizes. And uh, when you analyze them, there's probably maybe one third of half of the gene ontology gene sets actually have less than five genes or less than three genes. So there's a huge number of very small pathways and a uh, and small number of very large pathways. What you want to do for interpretation sometimes is to select a meaningful range uh, to test in your enrichment. So for example, we often uh, discard pathways that are smaller than five and discard pathways uh, that have more than a thousand genes. So these are more like, you know, meta big processes you don't necessarily gain a lot by using these, uh, uh, these very large or very small pathways because they're hard to interpret, but you win considerably in this multiple testing issue because you just leave aside a lot of data that you don't want to interpret well um, and then focus on the one on the slice of the data that's more interpretable, uh, but you also rescue yourself from the multiple testing issue. All right, uh, to summarize what we discussed so far, um, there were a couple of statistical tests that are commonly used in pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, there are obviously more, and they will be discussed more in the workshop. Uh, if you just have a gene list and there is no ranking involved, uh, then you can use a Fisher's exact test to determine the surprisingness of pathways in your gene list. Uh, more informative tests uh, work uh, on ranked gene lists. Probably they're also more sensitive because they capture smaller and larger pathways in the same go. One of them is called the minimum hypergeometric test. Uh, this is included in GeoProfiler. Uh, the very com common and popular one is called GSEA. Uh, that will be discussed uh, by Veronique later. Uh, and then if you have your custom data, then there are some statistical tests that you can work from. For example, Wilcoxon test or Man Whitney or Kolmogorov Smirnov test that allow you to interpret ranked lists of genes. Uh, with the GSEA, I'd like to just give you like a quick caveat that it has been designed for microarray data, and then just out of the box, it doesn't necessarily work on like next generation sequencing data. It's something to be aware of.
uh, but you can you can work around with it uh, by adding custom layers of statistical tests. Now, multiple testing correction is essential in pathway analysis and also elsewhere uh, in omics analysis. We have so many pathways. We, we conduct many tests on these pathways. Moreover, we assume that the pathways are independent, but they're not. Uh, so any, any meaningful pathway analysis will give you many results, and you need to carefully correct for all the, all the biases coming from multiple tests. Uh, Bonferroni was a test um, where you essentially multiply your p-value by the number of tests you took, and that's very stringent in most situations. Uh, and more, more contemporary and commonly used tests uh, like the false discovery rate procedure by Benjamin and Hochberg are more forgiving uh, because they, they also loosen up uh, the conditions a little bit. So you allow a percentage of uh, results to be wrong rather than a single count of um, real results to be wrong. And fortunately, we don't need to do these procedures by coding them in, but most of the statistical packages will do them for you if you ask. Okay. Uh, so to uh, summarize the learning objectives, uh, you should be able to select the appropriate enrichment test for your data. The main, main two classes are ordered gene lists and flat gene lists. Uh, you should be able to determine the appropriate background set uh, when you're doing your analysis. And this is where you have to think uh, carefully about what your experimental design was, how did you determine your gene list or protein list, and if there's anything that you missed in the general genome-wide gene background, and you maybe you should use a custom background list instead. And you should be able to uh, understand what the minimum hypergeometric test does, uh, and then you need to be able to determine when and how to do multiple testing correction, and then explore the different, the two different families of tests, really, uh, Bonferroni and uh, FTR. And, and also I encourage you to look around if there's any, anything that specifically deals with your type of data. And uh, a G profiler to run a little bit in advance will have a specific correction uh, for multiple testing that also attempts to account for the fact that gene ontology processes are hierarchically related and there are smaller processes within larger processes. Okay, um, that concludes the lecture, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Just uh, one question on the actual usage. So uh, usually when you want, let's say, to, to automate the whole thing, so you have done like your RNA seq or whatever, and you come up with uh, the candidate genes that uh, change, you know, are differentially expressed, and then you want to, let's suppose, to automatically do some kind of an out of this uh, downstream analysis, so either DSA or to use the profiler or so which ones of these tools actually offer, uh, you know, the command line uh, thing? Uh, I am a big user of R, and I know that there's a large number of R packages that do various kinds mm -hmm. of pathway analysis. Uh, G-Profiler has an R package. Mm -hmm. uh, you may want to consider the fact that this R package is actually not doing local computation, but it's accessing the server um, mm -hmm. back in Estonia, which could mm, be a problem if you wanted to analyze 1,000 lists of genes at the same time. Yeah. Otherwise it works, and the advantage is that the, you know that the data are up to date. Mm -hmm. Other packages require you to download data, and then you just you have this extra step of figuring out where to get the data. Uh, in general, command line tools are available, and if you need to design a custom approach, then you you could download something called a GMT file, which is essentially a database of gene sets, and then design your analysis around that.